This build really makes no sense. I mean, two weeks ago, I was telling all of you not to purchase an FX processor, period, because Zen is just around the corner. And we're talking about a CP that relies on PCI Express 2.0 and doesn't even use DDR4. Nonetheless, got the platform for a very great price. And while browsing on Newegg last week, I came across an AMD Sapphire R9 Fury for a whopping 280 US dollars, a deal I could not pass up, me being me, so I purchased the card, got here today, I put the rest of the rig together today, and decided to do a step-by-step -step tutorial for all of you interested in building an AMD gaming PC. Not something I would advise for most gamers, but if you're a baller on a budget and you're considering, I don't know, an AMD FX8300 or an i3-6100, and that's your absolute max you can spend on a CPU, Kind of makes sense to go with an FX8300. That's all I'm going to say. I didn't choose the 8300 here. I have 8320E, which is slightly higher clocked and slightly more efficient in terms of power consumption. But across the board, you're going to get a full 8 cores, which will benefit you in DirectX 12. And thanks to the R9 Fury, you're going to be able to game in 1440p, no problem. Maybe a little light 4K as well. I wouldn't say GTA 5 in 4K or Battlefield 1 in 4K, but... You get the point, some light 4K gaming too. So you're gonna be relatively future-proof. I'll show you the benchmarks in a separate video. This is the step-by-step -step build guide. Here it goes. For this build, a few things were compromised and still a few others were overkill to the max. It's just, it's my fault. The compromises, the motherboard and the CPU cooler. But I bought this motherboard from Micro Center for 15 bucks. See this video here if you're a bit curious as to how that happened. So that's my excuse there. And it comes with surround sound audio support and dedicated graphics, something FX processors don't have built in. It's also in the Micro ATX form factor, which means it'll look really weird in our ATX case. Again, whatever. As for the CPU cooler, I debated whether to use the Deep Cool Captain 240EX, but went for the stock cooler because I wanted to save some money. And you all know how I feel about stock CPU coolers. Oh yeah. Uh, what is that? Here, can you hold the camera real quick? What are we doing, Greg? It's a really complicated door. Okay, okay. yep. Mm-hmm. Tell me that. Okay. Now for the overkill. First, the case. It was sent to me from Entities and I just had to use it. I mean, it's it's white. It's beautiful and sporting tempered glass on all three sides. For the sake of keeping our budget in check though, I'm listing an NZXT S340 also in the description. It's a much cheaper and eh, it's still beautiful option, more in line with a build like this. The other overkill component is the power supply. I only had a 1000 watt P2 from EVGA on hand and the excuse there is, well, I don't know. I really don't have an excuse, but I did link a solid solid 800 watt power supply, much cheaper in the description. The graphics card we're going with, the AMD Sapphire R9 Fury, demands up to 400 watts under the most strenuous GPU torture tests when unlocked, so an 800 watt power supply will keep us well within the efficiency curve. To begin building, remove your motherboard from its anti-static wrap and place it on top of its box. This will serve as a makeshift test bench slash assembly prop. Next, remove your CP from its box. Ours is the FX8320E, being careful not to touch any of its pins. Align the golden arrow on the chip with the white arrow on the board, lift the socket lever, and place the chip in the socket. Then all you need to do is lower the retention arm once more until the CPU is secured in place. Boom, you've installed a CPU. Grab a hold of the stock cooler or whatever cooler you intend to use and prepare it for installation. If you're using a third party cooler, refer to its corresponding manual. For this old thing here, all we need to do is latch both ends of the beam underneath the black mounting points. It should look like these here. Once both ends are wrapped around these points, rotate the black lever on the cooler 180 degrees. Your cooler should now be fastened tightly to your CPU and motherboard. You can use it as a handle of sorts to lift and move your motherboard from now on. It's a better option than touching the PCB itself. The last thing we need to knock out here is RAM installation. G-Skill provided 8GB and two 4GB variants of their Sniper Series DDR3 running at 1866MHz. These DIMMs are also linked in this video's description and come highly recommended. Referencing our motherboard manual, we need to install these modules into slots 1 and 3, so pull back on their locking mechanisms. Orient each module per the notch in each slot and use force to insert each. I said each a lot there, sorry about that. The clips on either side should snap into their locking positions once they've been properly secured. We're finished with the motherboard for now, so set it along with its box to the side. Grab a hold of your power supply at this point. If it's modular, it'll come with several detached cables, many of which you'll need to pre-install. If your PSU is non-modular, everything will be wired directly into the box to begin with. In our case, everything, including the 24-pin and EPS cables, is modular. With the peripherals we'll be using in mind, grab the 24-pin and CPU cables, two VGA 8-pin cables, a SATA cable, and a Molex cable. Both SATA and Molex denote power and data transfer interfaces. Modern components will only use SATA, but our case's integrated fan hub requires 
requires a single Molex connector as well. You can watch my review of this case by clicking the card right here. With necessary cables connected, remove the right side panel of your case and insert the power supply. If you're using an NZXT S340, you'll need to attach a bracket and slide it in directly from the back. Using your case's included PSU screws, a box of screws and tie straps is usually located in the hard drive bay. Fasten the power supply to the rear of the case, being sure to orient it fan side down, so long as the case has adequate ventilation underneath. We should also install storage drives at this point, things become very crammed once other wiring commences. Remove your SSD and or hard drive from its box and take advantage of the brackets provided. For an SSD, it's as simple as removing one of the three trays using four peripheral screws to fasten the drive and sliding the bracket back into place, held there by a single thumb screw. I didn't throw in a hard drive originally because I planned to use the one from Heisenberg for running gaming benchmarks, but I've linked a 1TB Western Digital Blue in the description which I recommend for general file storage. Be sure to install your operating system, however, on the SSD. While we're back here, plug in the SATA power and data cable. SATA cables should be in your motherboard's box. Don't worry about connecting the other end of this cable until after we finished installing the motherboard. Speaking of which, let's do that next. Lay your case on its side, keeping track of all cables, pull out your motherboard's IO shield, and snap it into the long rectangular cutout at the back of the case next to the fan opening. This will take some force and is perhaps the most frustrating part of PC building. I know, hard to believe. You'll see what I mean though. Next, using your CPU cooler as a handle of sorts, gently lower your motherboard into the case using both the I.O. shield and the included motherboard standoffs as guides. Once it is in place, use the included screws to secure it. Since this is a micro ATX board, we'll only have to worry about 6 screws, the larger ATX boards will require 8 or 9. Now turn your case back on its feet. Let's tackle the small wiring. There should be a strand of cables along the back of the case that connect to the front I.O. ports. USBs, the power and reset buttons, etc. Our motherboard doesn't have a USB 3.0 header so we can set this blue cable aside. But we do need to wire our hard drive LED, power button, reset button, and power LED leads. There should be a header on the motherboard with corresponding labels down toward the bottom. If this header isn't marked, you'll have to locate it in your motherboard's manual and connect the cables to the respective pins. I changed my mind. This is the most frustrating part. Don't forget about the HD audio cable either, which plugs into a header on the bottom left side of this board. Use the gap in the pin array as a guide. If USB 2.0 cables are present as well and included with other peripherals or coolers, plug them into their respective headers at the bottom of the board. Lastly, pull the SATA cable connected on one end to your SSD up through a cutout and connect it to a marked SATA hub on the board. If you have any extra drives, connect them to subsequent SATA hubs. Now we're ready for the graphics card. This is the R9 Fury, sporting a 4096-bit memory bus, 8 bits in a byte, which means it's capable of up to 512 gigabytes of memory transfer per second, all thanks to stackable HBM. As I said a bit earlier, I found it on Newegg for 280 bucks and have it linked in this video's description. Although I expect they'll be sold out very soon, so jump on that if you haven't already. To install this card, remove the two shields on the back aligning with the first full-length PCI Express slot. It's the only one on this motherboard. Push back on the latch and slide the graphics card into place. You should hear a firm click when it's fastened appropriately. Then take the two screws you removed from the back and while holding the card upright, screw them back into the rear of the case. These should keep the card relatively flat versus slanting downward while connected to the motherboard. Now it's time to route power cables to the graphics card and motherboard. Start with the VGA cables. We needed two of them for this particular card as it's rather power hungry. Funnel them through the rubber grounded cutout over the basement and connect both to the two 8 pin headers on the R9 Fury. They should click once they're fully inserted. Do the same for the 8 pin CPU cable. We'll only need one half of this for this particular board. It isn't the greatest overclocker, but 15 bucks, I'm not complaining. Funnel the 24-pin cable through as well and connect it to the large header on the board. Again, wait for the click. That's how you'll know when it's properly secured. With that, turn the case back around and cable manage as best you can. Take the time to verify that no peripheral is left unplugged as well. I almost forgot the Molex fan hub connector. Use tie straps and zip ties to route cables accordingly. Spare no expense, especially in a case like this with a see-through panel, especially on the right-hand side, which is rather unorthodox. Even though it'll likely be facing a wall, it's good practice in general. Once everything's tidy, reapply both the front and rear panels, clean up any blemishes, connect it to a surge protected outlet, and give it a go.
So there you have it folks, I hope you enjoyed the build log. If you have any other questions or concerns, be sure to leave those in the comments below. I, I'm not sure what I'm going to name this PC, I don't think it's going to last very long. I'm probably going to put it up on Craigslist or something and try to sell it for, for what I paid for basically. Uh, I don't really think that I'm going to keep it around very long, but I do want to test the R9 Fury in Heisenberg. I think it'll be interesting to see how much better or worse Heisenberg fares with an R9 Fury versus a single GTX 1070. So I think the 1070 is a more powerful card, but in DirectX 12 with that margin shrink and if it does by how much. So uh, interesting videos on the way. Thanks for watching the build log. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up if you thought it was cool. Give it a thumbs down if you do feel the complete opposite or if you hate everything about life. I had too much sugar in my coffee this morning. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Stay tuned for those benchmarks I was just talking about. This is Salazar Studio. Thanks for building with us.